not have an HOA, you yeah. know, like most people in Florida, yeah. but this is what you can do. It's researching varieties, like finding things that have characteristics that do well in Florida. Um, a lot of things are not popular, you haven't heard of them. So I try really hard to um, put that information out there. There's there's a lot of options out there. You just you gotta find them and connect with um, you know the people or the companies that provide those types of varieties. Hi, my name is Jara. I'm born and raised here in Florida. I'm gonna show you my very small backyard garden. I live in a normal Florida neighborhood with an HOA. So I want to inspire others to at least try some different things. There are things that you can grow even with a small space, even in a normal neighborhood with an HOA and in Florida, because that's the trick. Florida, our climate, we're subtropical, which is unlike the rest of the country and gardening here. You can be very successful, but you just got to understand our climate and timing of the year and which kinds of plants actually do well here. So I'm going to show you a tour of my entire garden. This is the front of my house. I can't grow like vegetables and fruit trees as much as I would love to, but at least I landscape with plants for the pollinators. So at the front here, I have a ton of um, salvias. This is the indigo spires and the mystic spires varieties. I have milkweed in here for the monarch butterflies and a lot of different um, tubular shaped plants that attract the hummingbirds. So this um, really, I'm trying to maximize the space and use plants that are not just ornamental or landscape, typical landscape plants, but plants that do double duty, that they attract the pollinators or help the bees or butterflies in some way. And it still looks beautiful and it's still really low maintenance. So here I also plant a lot of pineapples. Every single one of these I saved from the tops of pineapples that I bought at the grocery store and I just put them in the ground and they grow and they will produce, here's one that's producing right now, um, at least one pineapple for you. I think maybe even two if you let the plant continue living after you harvest the first pineapple. I cram in a lot of stuff. You'll see that my whole garden is just really, really full. Um, I stick stuff in every space I can find because if you don't and you leave uh, open spaces, it'll something else will grow there and it'll be weeds. So I part of what I do is cram in it's kind of like a mix, a cottage style garden type of mix, and it, it works out really great. Um, so again, more of the flowers for the pollinators. I was hoping that will help pollinate the uh, rollinias. And then I also have two apple trees. A lot of people think apples don't grow in Florida. You typically see the Anna and the Dorset varieties are like all the nurseries or whatever. But I actually found um, a backyard grower their name is Stone River Nursery. They're 10 minutes from me. I'm in Orlando, Florida, by the way, zone 9B. <laughs> They're 10 minutes from me. And he takes heritage varieties of apples that I've never heard of, I've never seen anywhere else. And he grafts them on a special root stock that helps them grow better here in our climate and require less chill hours. Because if they don't get a certain amount of cold hours per year, it won't trigger the flowering process and then you won't get any fruit. So he has several of these apples growing in his own backyard. He posts pictures of harvesting them and everything right here in Orlando, Florida. So I actually have about four apple trees that I got from him and a nectar plum that he, I don't know, he hybridized or something or got a, a, a hybrid uh, scion and grafted it himself. Um, so he has just some really cool stuff and I always like to support other local nurseries, backyard gardeners, so go check them out. You can find them on Facebook or Instagram at Stone River Nursery. This is a big uh, butterfly bush for the butterflies. Monarch butterflies always swarming around here because of this plant. Um, I've got cannas. I stick more pineapples. I don't know how many pineapples I have. I have a lot because I, I just don't dare throw one away. <laughs> if it's a plant, I don't ever want to throw it away. So there's a whole bunch there. Here is a grummy chama. And this is actually um, becoming an endangered species because 
it, it it does produce seed they're like little cherries but it has a hard time spreading the seed around and getting them to germinate this is typically grown in south america they get a little bigger than that and they're best picked when they're absolutely dark like a dark dark purple they're sweet they kind of taste like jabba the kaba or grape kind of mixture there and the birds love this so and not only that it's a really beautiful ornamental plant with glossy leaves so again this is a great choice for a landscape plant that does double duty feeds the birds and you can eat from it too um, my garden i decided to go with raised beds because i wanted to bring in better soil i built these raised beds myself out of um, pressure treated wood i don't have a truck so i had to find materials and things that were easy for me to bring in a car and for me to put together so i've had these beds here um, probably about four years some of them are newer than others but i have been building up this garden for about four years now um, this is the double blue Thai butterfly pea. <laughs> um, it's double because it has more ruffled petals. The regular one is doesn't have so many petals. And this is used to make a very high antioxidant tea. You just dry the, the flowers and you just take a couple of them and steep them in tea. It turns the tea a blue color. Really beautiful, very commonly found in Thailand. But it's a great, um, not only beautiful flowering plant, but it's perennial here in the warmer climates. If you're up north, it definitely will get affected by the cold, but it's a perennial beautiful flowering vine and you can make tea with it. Back here is the African blue basil. This is one plant. <laughs> it's giant. Um, the bees absolutely love this stuff. It is a hybrid basil and it doesn't produce seed. It doesn't um, go to seed for whatever reason, its genetics just doesn't allow that. So the only way you can get it is by propagating um, actual stems, or maybe you could find some in a nursery. I typically find this in Lucas Nursery in Orlando, Florida. They usually have a bunch in stock at all times, but number one plant for the bees. They're always all over this. And then here's one of my raised beds. Um, again, I like to cram stuff in a very small space. Um, right here, this is one tomato plant. This is called a uh, triple L crop Italian tree tomato. Very, very huge tomatoes. Um, some are ripening right now. Um, tomatoes are probably like my favorite thing to grow. For whatever reason, I really love growing heirloom tomatoes. But in Florida, we grow tomatoes fall, winter, and spring. If you're up north of Florida, you're gonna grow them spring and summer. Our summer actually kills off all the tomato plants. You will not be able to grow tomatoes here in Florida during the summer. So this plant has been here in this spot since about September. I have harvested multiple flushes from it. And I know by the end of June, all, with all the summer heat and rain that comes through, that's it. <laughs> it's, these plants are gonna die. And that's just the way it is here in Florida. But in the meantime, since I know I have, it's the beginning of May, I have about a month and a half left with these. I've already started other plants so that by the time my two big tomatoes die off, the other plants are already growing and I'm still continuing to harvest something um, edible and produce out of my garden. So down here, I have a bunch of sweet corn. I do like to start my sweet corn seeds um, in little cells just to ensure better germination. And then I pop them into the ground. This is a sweet corn variety that gets about six feet tall. So not the tallest, but because it's shorter, I can cram them in closer. So I literally have them six to eight inches apart in four rows and it works. Um, corn just needs a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. So it's one of the few instances that I use fertilizer that isn't organic. I just use 10, 10, 10 because it's such a heavy feeder. So this will probably be ready to harvest in about two more months and it'll be up high um, and it won't be like affecting the growth of the rest of the plants behind them. This plant right here is the tromboncino rampicante. It's a really, really big squash variety from Italy. Unfortunately, I don't have any forming right now, but it forms these really big baseball bat size squashes. And if you pick them young, you can use them just like zucchini. I even like them better than zucchini because the texture is firmer. When you cook it, it doesn't get squishy and watered down. Um, and it produces a lot of food. It's pretty resistant to a lot of our pests and diseases here. 
I pretty much grow this year round. I This one started flowering, it's gonna start producing. So I already popped in a new one, um, direct um, soda into the ground so that it'll start growing. By the time this one is done producing, I already have the next plant coming up. And for my household, I only need one. <laughs> this produces so much food. Um, and it pretty much grows here all year except our coldest months, which would be like December and January. Underneath, I have some purple yard long beans. Um, I usually grow like bush beans and pole beans like early spring and fall, um, but they don't really like our heat that much once it starts getting like summertime. So at that point, I switch on over to the yard long beans. I love them. They taste like green beans, but they're a tropical plant. And so they do much, much better here in our climate in Florida during the summer. And they're heavy producers. They're long beans. I have more on the other side, different colors, different varieties, but um, they're long beans and I just cut them up into shorter pieces and cook them just like you would um, green beans. So that's all that's below here. It'll overtake this and grow in the empty spaces that are left by the bigger vine of the tromboncino repicante. So everything gets sunlight and coexists and is happy there. Um, I also incorporate tons of flowers. Nasturtiums are great. They're a trap crop for aphids. The aphids love, um, I guess the stems, they, they have a lot of fluid or water in them and aphids are a sucking type of insect. So they swarm this and leave the rest of my garden alone. I don't have to treat for aphids. Um, the, I have nasturtiums all over my garden. They, they leave all my crops alone and that's just a, an idea for how to garden organically. Um, you can also eat the flowers of nasturtiums. They have a very nice peppery flavor. You can just add it onto the top of a salad or something like that. I think the leaves are also edible, but I haven't tried that. It also attracts a lot of beneficial insects. So not only is it a trap crop for the aphids, but it also brings in a lot of the beneficial insects like the ladybugs and things like that, that eat the aphids and the other bad insects in the, in the garden. I, I very rarely treat for anything. And I think it's my combination of like the nasturtiums, other flowers for the beneficial insects and herbs. I have herbs also all over the place. Uh, these are uh, different kinds of sunflowers. I have tons of different varieties all over my garden. The sunflowers are great for the pollinators. The bees and butterflies really love them. Um, but I also like uh, when they're done you know, flowering for me, I harvest the leaves, the stems, chop them all up. I use them as a mulch on my beds. I incorporate them into composting. Uh, I cannot have like a big compost pile like out in the open. I am in a HOA neighborhood, but I do compost in place instead. So I take leaves. Um, I grow a lot of marigolds. This will get really, really big and bushy because again, I'm chopping off the leaves and stems from that and throwing them on top as in layers on my beds. Um, I do not till my beds. I just put layers and layers and layers um, and do not disturb it. That way the mycorrhizae and, and the bacteria and good fungi and all that can grow and have their network spread out throughout the garden and the soil. I have tons of earthworms in all of my beds. I did not bring them into my garden. They just naturally came here because again, I'm composting in place. I also put layers of cardboard and I'll have an example of one over here um, and they love paper products. So they eat up paper and cardboard and it naturally will attract them into your bed. Um, but yeah, so sunflowers are great. Not only are they beautiful, but you can use the stems, leaves, all of that as part of your composting uh, system. I have a ton of rattlesnake pole beans. This one does pretty well and handles our heat pretty well. Um, I'm letting this one go to seed so I can harvest my own seed. I do um, sell seeds in my Etsy shop. Um, so they're drying out right now and then I'll be harvesting all of those. This is asparagus. I have quite a few asparagus plants. They do grow in Florida, um, given that they have pretty good soil. With, uh, there's a lot of compost in here um, and they're pretty low maintenance. Uh, to trigger them to start producing in a warmer climate though, you do have to chop them all down. Um, I chop mine down probably like middle of January or so when they're absolutely browned up and dried. And that triggers it to think it's going dormant and spring is coming. And then it'll start sending up new shoots of asparagus. I've already harvested asparagus for this year. Um, so now I'm letting it grow so that its bulb um, or root system can gain more mass and strength so that next year I'll get even more asparagus. 
Beneath here, I have bush beans. Um, they're pretty much done. Uh, again, it's getting really, really hot and they're just not happy with that kind of weather. But I had a huge row here of harvester and golden wax bush beans, which I found do really, really well here in Florida. They were pretty disease resistant. Now they're getting diseases because they're on, on the out, like they're almost done for the year. This is a hybrid basil. I don't know the name of it, but it has been growing here for more than a year now. And basils, they get really bad, like leaf diseases, black spot, all this stuff. Um, but this one doesn't. It just keeps growing and it, it's an Italian basil. So um, I, I love this thing. I'm so glad I found it. I don't really promote like hybrids very much, but this one actually is good for a reason. <laughs> it, it, it is perennial basically here. Underneath here, I have some squashes. So a lot of what I do is I will plant and raise beds or whatever and stick the really big like squash plants or watermelons and things like that in like the side or the corner so that the lines can spill out and it'll grow like all over. And that kind of helps me cram again, more things into a smaller space. This is a Guatemalan blue squash. I've never grown it before, but we'll see what that is. This is a, a blackberry actually. I have a couple of them back here. So they are now waking up for spring and they're starting to grow and they'll overtake this um, trellis back there. I guess we'll start um, looking at all the fruit trees I have here. Um, these are two different orange varieties. This is the page orange. This is a honey bell tangelo. Um, this is a Jabba de Caba. Has not started fruiting for me yet, but they, they tend to need to get pretty big before they'll start fruiting. I cram my fruit trees together. A lot of people think you need, I don't know, 10 feet, 15 feet in between your fruit trees. And that's just not true, especially for the backyard grower. Um, you want your fruit trees to stay small, number one, because you are not gonna be able to reach up high and harvest whatever fruit. Uh, you'll have a lot of waste that way as well. So I keep these and maintain them at a small, um, shorter size anyways. And then you can fit them closer together. I also fertilize all my fruit trees with citrus fertilizer and small doses monthly. I know that's a little bit more frequent than what other people might do, but I've been doing that for years and my oranges look super healthy. The leaves are glossy and dark green. Um, these are relatively new. They've only been here for one year in this spot. But underneath all my fruit trees, I don't plant like vegetable crops underneath of them, but I plant a lot of herbs, flowers, um, to pretty much overtake uh, and crowd out the weeds and then they kind of compost in place, die, you know, their leaves are falling down. They keep the roots of all my fruit trees cooler. So basically like a living mulch. Um, this is Cuban oregano. It's almost like an invasive thing to be honest because it just, it grows like crazy. Uh, but I also like that it's an herb. It has a very strong scent and I think it really does help repel a lot of pests. I don't, again, like I don't really treat my fruit trees for any pest issues except for scale um, every now and then. But this Cuban oregano is a great idea for um, like a ground cover. I also use longevity spinach and Okinawan spinach. This is the Okinawan, it has purple underneath its leaves. And the longevity is just like a green color. They're completely edible. Uh, you can eat these in salads and whatever. So if I, I'm going to decide on something to use as a ground cover. It really is cool if it's something you can eat as well. And they all spread very quickly. Um, I also like the fact that they are like vines like this. So if I do want to yank them out, it's very easy to get rid of them. You just pull out the vines and you can clean up the area and, and plant something else there if that's what you want to do. This is an angel trumpet uh, tree. Don't have any flowers on it right now. But in, in here I have other flowers growing too to attract the pollinators and help them out. Here is kind of where I put all my seedlings and things because it has a, a little bit of shade just to protect them a little bit as they grow. Um, behind me are more fruit trees. Um, this is a nectarine. This is a peach. We've been slowly harvesting them as they are ready when they're soft to the touch or give a little bit. Um, this is the Florida Prince variety, very common in a lot of nurseries. Um, and this one, I think it's a sun racer, nectarine. But both of these are really good plants for a small backyard because they, they're dwarf, so they're gonna stay like about this size. And after it's done fruiting and I harvest everything, I'm gonna hard prune this because next year's fruit will develop on this year's new growth, basically. So 
in June, about, about in June, I will be hard pruning this off. It's gonna put on a lot of new growth. And then next year, that's where all the new um, peaches are gonna form from. So you're gonna keep it small anyways. So it's a great option for the smaller backyards. Again, more pollinator plants. Um, this area kind of gets a little shady. So I pop in, um, this is a uh, Alabama blue collards. It's um, a very old heirloom variety. I have a bigger one right here or two. Um, the veining of it is purple. It's a very tender leaved collard green. I don't even really like collard greens, but I love this one. It has a very smooth and velvety texture. Not very well known. Most people grow like the Georgia collards and stuff like that. Um, and I don't know why, because this tastes way, way better than those. This is the Mexican sunflower, also known as Tithonia. There's an orange and a yellow variety. The pollinators love this. It attracts the hummingbirds, butterflies. Um, also, this grows really tall and puts out a lot of biomass that, again, you can cut it down and use it for composting as well, or mulching. This is a carry mango. I really like the mangoes that don't have fibers. Um, this is, she's probably been in this spot for like three years. Uh, she took a hard hit from that cold front we had in, in January. This is lemongrass. So lemongrass, not only is a great herb, um, you can cook with it, you can make tea with it. My family makes a tea um, with lemongrass and actual lemons. Um, but it grows a lot of biomass as well. It gets really, really bushy. Actually, I'm gonna be cutting these down any day now. And again, you can use this as compost or mulch and just layer it on top of your soil. This is a Meyer lemon tree. Um, they almost produce year round. So here's the first um, fruit here, and then I've already got some more flowers. Um, pretty, pretty good and interesting lemon. It's not like the traditional lemons you find in the grocery store. They're special. They have more of a sweeter kind of flavor to them um, than like regular uh, lemons. This is uh, Thai chilies, those little red Thai chilies. I actually uh, bought some in the Asian grocery store and I took the seeds out and I just planted it and it's growing. This is comfrey. Comfrey, I find does a lot better again in an area that gets afternoon shade. But comfrey is really important in the garden because it has a very long taproot. It probably goes 10 feet down. So it pulls up a lot of minerals, iron, just all this stuff, and it brings it to the soil surface. So I have a mango, um, actually I have two mango trees like crammed right there, um, right next to it, uh, hoping that it will help, you know, give some of those nutrients off to it. You can also trim out the leaves, which also have all those nutrients in them and soak them in water for a couple days or so to make your own uh, fertilizer, basically. Um, I have seen people in Florida um, cram in mangoes and avocados, like a five foot diameter ring, and they'll shove like 10 trees in there. They will grow fine like that in that, in that closeness. And they also will cross pollinate with each other, which helps increase production. Again, you're gonna maintain them all at a smaller size. And just as long as you fertilize them consistently, nobody's gonna be um, fighting for nutrients or anything like that. So it still still works out. This is a Brogdon avocado. Uh, I think it's a pretty good producer because it was half the size and I was able to harvest some last year. And this year it's grown a lot more and I have a couple more on here. A uh, very good variety for Florida if you're looking for the avocados to make like guacamole that are, have a higher oil and fat content um, as opposed to like the typical big Florida avocados that are kind of more watery. This is Moringa. This is a dwarf variety because again, um, I don't have a lot of space. So I found a dwarf variety that I started from seed. Moringa is a superfood. The entire plant is edible. It's seeds, it's leaves, stems, root, like everything. Um, you can dry the leaves and make a tea out of it. I believe it has um, very high plant protein. Um, iron, just a lot of nutrients. Um, you can dry the leaves and put them in like your smoothies. Um, but what, I'm growing this because I want to use it as a fertilizer as well. There's a lot of nutrients in here, so I wanna chop and drop um, the leaves and use it all around my garden. In the Philippines, uh, my dad is actually in the Philippines right now and he has a garden. They take the leaves and they soak them in water and then blend it to make a fertilizer. So that's a, a fantastic idea um, with the Moringa. This one is a Florida Haas variety. The typical Haas varieties of avocados, they don't like to grow in Florida. They don't like our humidity. They, you can find them mostly like in California and places like that. 
But this variety, um, I guess, was bred specifically to handle the humidity a little bit better here in Florida. These are two lychees. This is Brewster, which handles Florida soil very well. And Mauritius, I believe Mauritius is the most popular variety for um, commercial farming. You'll find it uh, the most common variety, basically. And I put them both together. They do get pretty big and bushy. Um, again, they'll cross-pollinate with each other. This is a purple tree collard. Um, typically this would not grow well in Florida, just like the other collards, but um, I have it in a spot. This, this does get afternoon shade later on in the day. This will grow like six feet tall and it is a perennial. Um, however, in Florida, it, it, it is easy to die off with the heat, so that might happen. But I decided to grow this from seed. I found it on online. There's like a purple tree collard project website and um, they have the seeds for this. It's been in this spot for like two years. So somehow it survived that long. I do need to stake it up though, because again, it gets really tall and it could break if I don't stake it up. This is an achacha, which is the closest thing I can grow to a mangosteen because mangosteens are super tropicals. They won't even grow very well here in zone 9B, um, but the achacha will, it handles a little bit more cold. It's a yellow colored fruit and the flavor is a little similar to mangosteen. This is a, uh probably the main uh, vegetable side. Uh, the majority of my raised beds are over here. Again, I love growing tomatoes. <laughs> um, I don't know how many varieties I have in here. Uh, so I call these like my tomato walls. I build these trellises uh, with this heavy duty vinyl. This is electrical conduit. No tools needed, by the way, which is great. Um, T-post and PVC T-pipes. So I just put them together. They withstand um, heavy crops. They withstand hurricanes. Um, and if I want to move my whole garden, rearrange things, I just take it apart and I can easily move it around. But it definitely supports the weight of all my tomatoes. Uh, this is probably the last bit of tomatoes I'll be getting before June comes and everything dies. So again, knowing that these plants are going to die soon, um, in the middle, I started some squash. This is Alexandria squash or zucchini. It's a hybrid, one of the very few that I will actually grow in my garden and promote because it withstands diseases here like amazing, the pests, everything. And it is a super, super productive um, zucchini. If you've ever grown zucchini before, you notice that it grows kind of like a spinal cord. That's what it reminds me of, like a big, long spinal cord. Um, and it produces along that whole cord. Uh, if you have vine borers or squash bugs, they will dig into that vine and kill the whole plant. But this one, I have seen it grow two or three different vines or like spinal cords. So even though a squash bug may have gotten to one of them, the plant is still surviving on the other branches. Like it, it is insane just how productive and resistant that variety is. I still spray if I see damage for uh, from the chewing insects, like the pickle worms or army worms, because if I don't, they will literally populate my entire garden in a week and kill everything. So I still spray, I use BT or spinosad um, to treat for the worms. I also use it on the tomatoes. I do get um, really bad army worms, usually like in March. I think I've passed that um, period with them. But if I didn't use those products, there's no way I'd be able to grow a lot of things. Like the sweet corn gets obliterated by army worms, or not army worms, um, corn ear, earwig, corn earwig worms. And I use spinosad on those and I can grow corn perfectly almost year round from like January all the way to September is when I'm last sowing my last um, corn seeds. But I have to use spinosad or those worms would just eat the whole thing up. Um, both of those are organic products. Um, however, I always tell people, you know, be smart when you're using them. Only spray in the evening when the pollinators are gone. Only spray the affected plants. Like, don't spray the flowers and stuff that the bees like to get onto. And you should be fine. Like, I, I don't have issues with bees here or anything like that because I'm using BT or spinosad. This is an example of composting in place. So whenever I have parts of beds that are empty, I don't have anything growing in it at that time, I need to cover it with something. So this is all corn stalks, banana leaves, marigolds, like whatever um, biomass I can find, I spread it on the top. Then I get cardboard and I put that on top and then I'll throw like a couple inches of new compost. 
So all of that is going to decompose together, attract all the earthworms, shade out the weeds. I don't have to till, I don't have to weed. <laughs> so that is what I do. Um, this is the cardboard I'm planning to use to break apart and kind of cover this area. But underneath is just a bunch of sunflowers, just anything that I could find at the time and keep it covered. I'll probably be planting stuff in here at the end of summer or something, whatever next crops I have. Um, this area in the middle here is kind of shaded because I have, again, more tomatoes. So the kale is still surviving. It's May, so that's pretty impressive um, because, again, it's getting that afternoon shade. I even have some tatsoi, which is probably the most heat-tolerant variety of Asian green that I recommend. Um, but even that I don't think will survive here after June. But I do have tatsoi growing pretty happily in there. Again, more nasturtiums all over. Um, this is chamomile. So chamomile, I like to grow it for the flowers. I harvest and dry the flowers for tea. Nothing is better than like freshly harvested um, chamomile flowers, um, but they don't like the heat here in Florida. So I start the seeds like in September or October, and then I plant them here, I don't know, around December, they grow throughout that whole season. They will start flowering now for a little bit until summer pretty much comes and kills them off. These are marigolds, they're, the, they're supposed to be the shorter variety, um, but again, I grow a lot of marigolds for their biomass. There is people that say it helps with nematodes. I don't really have a nematode problem in my garden. I think it's because I'm like composting all the time with layers, so they're not like infesting all of that, so to speak. Um, I think they really like like the, the native Florida sandy soil, um, but that helps when you have good quality, you know, composted soil. But I also use a lot of marigolds within my composting. Uh, I, I don't know if there's research to prove, you know, how exactly marigolds affects um, nematodes or gets rid of them. I've tried looking up things myself, but there's there has to be some correlation because I don't really have a nematode problem. And these beds are old, they're like four years old. Um, so definitely use tons of marigolds. These all popped up here on their own. Like I didn't even have to grow, uh, you know, start seeds and germinate them myself. They just pop up all over and that's completely fine with me. Um, this is supposed to be like my bell pepper bed. So I have a couple bell peppers that I started from seed um, in December. They've been growing in here. They're just now starting to produce, but I like mine to be like completely red. So, oops, I pulled it off. <laughs> that's fine. You can eat them in the green stage, obviously, as well. This one is pretty loaded. Um, I have to build some cages for them because they do need support. Um, if not, the branches will break under the weight of the fruit. So I need to, that's my next project here. But in between um, the whole spaces of these peppers, I direct sowed some delicata squash. So that will kind of overtake this and shade the roots out. On this side, I have a Korean um, melon. I forget the name of it. Um, for whatever reason, I suck at growing melons and watermelons. They just never really produce well for me here. Uh, but this Korean one is at least there's two little babies there um, growing. So must be doing much better than the other varieties I've tried. Uh, this is dahlias actually. A lot of people again say dahlias don't grow in Florida. This area does get afternoon shade. And I just bought these bulbs at Lowe's. <laughs> they usually have them in around February, a bunch of different varieties. And I tried it and they do grow. They're big, beautiful flowers. Um, I'm glad it, it worked out. Um, over here is a lot of Everglades tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So Everglades tomatoes, they're really small current size. Let me see if I can find one for you. Um, they came here from South America, but they've pretty much naturalized in the Everglades. I don't fertilize them. I don't water them. I don't do anything. And all of these reseeded. They had decided to pop up and grow here on their own. So it, it pretty much grows year round here and you don't have to do much to it. They are small and a lot of people would say, well, like, what am I gonna do with all these small tomatoes? Um, I roast them, I put them on salads. They kind of have a very savory type of flavor, like umami-ish in my opinion, but really, really good. Um, An easy crop to grow in Florida. They sprawl out, they don't need support. They pretty much sprawl out um, and they are shading out weeds from growing in this unused spot of my garden at, at the time. So um, really cool little thing native to Florida if you want to try growing that. 
this is the red yard long noodle. So I have purple on one side of my house. I have red on this side. Um, to be honest, they look the same. I don't, I don't know. The colors very, very similar. Um, but they grow great here in Florida during the summer. This is an unknown variety. I don't, I forgot. Um, but it is a nice, thick, meaty um, green bean. Um, I do have seeds for that in my shop as well because it, it's very, very productive green bean and tolerates a lot of the heat as well. This is, I want to say a banana squash. So I had planted squashes in here and this is one of the few that made it for whatever reason. Again, because the vines will grow and shade out everything. Uh, I do have one forming. So we'll see, I've never tried um, banana squash before but they're supposed to get like really, really big. So we'll see how that one turns out. Uh, I do hand pollinate my squashes and my zucchinis because I wanna ensure that every single one um, will produce fruit for me. This is a light green colored yard, yard long bean, which is actually my favorite because it's um, the thicker, it's just thicker and meatier. Um, I'm letting these go to seed as well so I can collect seed. Uh, these are Nicotianas. I, I didn't think this would grow here in Florida or the bachelor buttons because these kind of remind me of like cottage gardens up north. So I just, I really didn't think they would do well, but I started them from seed, I want to say like in November or something. And they've been growing here over winter and they're, they're gorgeous. And at night, the whole garden smells really, really good. This is more tomatoes. <laughs> I always, I have so many tomatoes. And what sucks is I'm going to have to rotate my beds because they attract a lot of nematodes and bad, um, you know, insects and just stuff. So I can't grow them in the same spot again. I actually got two varieties of tomatoes grown in Greece. Um, I met a guy, he's a Greek farmer on the island of Paros that's very close to Santorini. And he gave me seeds for, this is a fluted one and a smoother one. And it's what they use in Greece for their traditional recipes and cooking, um, tomato fritters. So really cool heritage um, tomato that he's been growing on his family's land. He doesn't know how many generations, they've always been there. That's how far, that's how long they've been growing these tomatoes there. This is more of the uh, light green um, yard long beans. This is uh, lemon cucumbers. It's loaded with flowers, but I don't see any forming yet, but we'll see. Um, and I have more beans, everything kind of crammed together. I had a row of onions even. Um, they're not the biggest onions, but they're, they're still growing. This is just a mix of kales, komatsuna, um, Italian parsley. This was, um, I think one of the komatsunas that's flowering so I can uh, collect the seed. Um, I don't even clean this stuff up, <laughs> to be honest. I just keep growing more and more stuff on it. It decomposes on its own and, and cleans itself up. This is a variety of really, really long yard long bean, extra long, that I'm trying to also collect seeds from. Uh, but I like this one better than the traditional green one, the Orient Wonder, Wonder variety. Here's a whole bunch of them. These are pretty long too, but those are longer. <laughs> so um, that's why I like experimenting with different varieties of things because you always find new ones that are interesting in different ways. Um, here I'm going to grow a bunch of the Asian variety of cucumbers. So for summertime, you can grow cucumbers here in Florida. You just, again, have to manage the chewing uh, worm insects. So again, use BT or spinosad, but they will grow. Um, I don't do the traditional like pickling cucumbers and stuff like that because I feel like they don't, they don't do as well here in our heat and rain, whereas the Asian varieties tend to be more tropical kind of cucumbers. Um, so there's a couple here and they literally will overtake this entire area and they're very, very productive. This is a nine stars cauliflower. It is a perennial cauliflower. It doesn't form a big head. It forms like multi branches and you harvest those. This is an experiment. I'm trying to see if I can get this to survive our summers here. I don't think it will because the other, I had a, a bunch of them, but they're slowly like just dying off one by one. Um, so anyways, I'm trying to see if, if I can grow per, more perennial type crops. Um, this will definitely grow up north though, if you're north of Florida. More African blue basil for the pollinators. Um, tons of more tomatoes. This is more squash, um, Thai basil. This one is a, per, I don't know if it's perennial, 
but it's a non-heading type of broccoli. It's called Piracicaba. It's from Brazil. And I'm also testing this out to see how heat tolerant this is um, because normal broccoli is, will not grow here in summer um, here in Florida at all. They don't like that kind of heat. Um, so these are really tasty. They kind of, you eat them like this, even though the buds are kind of opening up, um, that's how they are. And it's kind of like if broccoli and asparagus had a baby, basically, that's the flavor of these. I really like this. Um, hopefully it survives the summer and I'll definitely be promoting it and recommending it to other Florida gardeners. Um, and here's just more kales, dill, um, more flowers, just trying to always keep the soil covered at all times. Yeah, if I find stuff, you know, it's, it's researching varieties, like finding things that have characteristics that do well in Florida. Um, a lot of things are not popular, you haven't heard of them. So I try really hard to um, put that information out there and educate, you know, other Floridians like, hey, Maybe you can't grow traditional cucumbers, but you can grow the Asian cucumbers and they taste just as well. Or maybe you can't grow uh, bush beans, but you can grow the yard long beans. Like there's there's a lot of options out there. You just you gotta find them and connect with, um, you know, the people or the companies that provide those types of varieties. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this garden tour and I hope it inspires you to try um, growing you know, crops or flowers for the pollinators right here in Florida it definitely is possible. If you want to find me, I am on Instagram and TikTok under Jara's Garden. And I also sell the very same seeds that I grow here in my garden on my Etsy shop, also called Jara's Garden. Well, thank you very much.